I like the idea of bringing the sacred back into everyday life. Sometimes we're just, I don't know, we live in a consumeristic society and, and those things are forgotten, but not by me. I don't, I don't um, really relate to fast food or, or fast sex or... Fast fashion. Fast fashion, not at all. I uh, was uh, raised on the Appalachian Trail. My mother's English and my father was from Martha's Vineyard. I'd certainly come from a creative stock. Uh, mother's a painter, but she was specialized in, in, in uh, art history. She's an art historian. And, uh, and my father was a, a, a low-flight pilot. I grew up with daddy building helicopters in the library, and then he'd take them, because it was a Victorian home, it had big uh, double doors that went outside. And so he'd build these very small, compact flying objects, and then take them through the double doors, and stick the propellers on them. Because he flew, he was, he, he was not there very often. We ended up spending um, a lot of time taking care of each other. There was very little parental guidance, very little um, adult uh, surveillance and control. And I think that's got a lot to do with why I grew up a free spirit. The pleasure taboo was not instilled upon me, and the body tab taboo. And I think that that allowed me to actually be brave enough to go and do what I do today. In 2001, I decided to actually reveal what my true passion was, which is erotic jewelry. I always found it a little bit um, difficult to find things that didn't have some sort of scary edge, or, or I'd find a really great design, but it was made in really sort of not such great materials, no? What I do also needs to have some sort of instruction next to it, which is another response to the market. I mean, today you can go online and buy anything, uh, even really extreme instruments of, uh, of pleasure. And uh, it comes in a box to your doorstep with no instructions. And I think that that could be dangerous. When I was going to school, my father was going bankrupt. And so he went from being uh, a full-fledged millionaire to gradually losing everything. And I remember that my Leo pride um, would not permit me to not go to school with new clothes or a new look or a new something or another. And, and I began making my own clothes very early. I designed probably 80% of what I wear. A piece that was made for me by Peter Dundas for the Cannes Film Festival. He agreed to work over uh, a pearl corset. So I'm, I'm actually hugged by pearl and embellished by Peter. Oh, my wardrobe was full of Vivian. It's that 20% that I haven't made. It's all about silhouette, which is what I love Vivian for. She defines the body. I think I wore this when I did my television program in, the, in Italy. I did a program called Boudoir, and it was one of the looks that, that Vivian gave to me for that program. Kimono. It's made in traditional kimono fabric by my Japanese seamstress, Chiharu. I love the, the double-sided fabric. I think it's incredible. It's a traditional, made specifically in Japan for kimonos. I love the idea of a kimono. I think it's one of the greatest shapes. It's definitely a, 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 um, a cultural identification, no? And I'm everything but Japanese. It's called the second skin, and that I've done for various parts of the bodies, you know, the body in general, from, from the feet to the hands to the shoulders, um, actually to a man's sex as well. I'm not today someone who is concerned with branding. I don't need to have the latest fashion on my back. And I haven't ever really. I mean, mm -hmm. I guess that started when I learned that I could make my own clothes. My mother had been uh, someone who helped to instigate America's civil rights revolution. She actually uh, joined what are now to know, known today as the Greensboro Four uh, in what was then called the sit down at a whites-only counter, and it was the sit-in that actually helped to spark America's civil rights revolution. So it was something that she kind of kept secret and hidden away from me because it uh, also caused her probably to lose, it was one of the reasons that she lost custody of the, her four girls, myself and my three sisters. She's definitely got something to do with my spirit of fighting for what I believe in. For 2,000 years we were suppressed, so I think that um, you know we've gone beyond what had to happen with the feminists, you know, who decided to really fight and battle. As I say that, though, it uh, it makes me rethink about a lot of things. Lately, I've been uh, going through the process of a divorce, 
in Italy as an American raised woman, I, I had a lot more freedom, for example, than Italian women do today. For the first time I thought, I'm not free. I'm not free. And I actually am a second class citizen, hmm. still today. So there's a lot of, of, of uh, a lot of work to be done. And I think that we, we underestimate sometimes, for example, in America, women do have more rights. Um, and uh, not every place is the same. That right now I'm working on empowering people through their sexuality. My goal is to break down that fear, dismantle the pleasure taboo, and um, help people to, to know, understand, accept, and explore their bodies and share in what is the most incredible bond and the most profound expression of the human spirit. I encourage people also to be their own mothers at a certain point. If you don't decide to be your own mother and maybe your own father too, um, you can't expect somebody else to do it for you. And I think it's a, it's a huge mistake risk. and it can make for a very painful path. So in the moment that you can be your own mother and your own father, you can assume responsibility for your actions. And I think that's really important to happiness, which is my ultimate goal.